we need to write the chapter for the 21st century. My invitation to any philosopher uh, out there, uh, especially if you're just starting now, don't rely too much on the past. Think with your own mind. We need new philosophical way of understanding the world that is in line with the challenges we have today. The past is a great history. It's what you build on. But don't think for a moment that we can just expand and extend chapters written in the past and business as usual. Welcome everyone to today's interview, where I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Luciano Floridi. He is Professor of Philosophy uh, and Ethics of Information at the University of Oxford, and also, as well Professor of Sociology of Culture and Communication at the University of Bologna, so he's a double appointment there. Um, his work has focused primarily on information, um, informational ethics, um, and has also covered a few other topics such as epistemology and, and logic. Um, his books include Information, A Very Short Introduction, the philosophy of information, the fourth revolution, how the infosphere is reshaping human reality, the ethics of medical data donation uh, with Jenny Kritzina, and uh, the logic of information, a theory of, philosoph a theory of philosophy as conceptual design, uh, among a few others. Um, he also has a variety of published articles. Feel free to add anything, but with that, welcome and, and thanks so much for being here, Professor Floridi. Well, thank you very much for your kind invitation. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Yeah, so I, awesome enough. <laughs> And thanks so much for being here. Yeah, so like, I want to start with some general questions about the about the philosophy of information, um, which to me seems kind of notoriously difficult. Um, in part because it's often like unclear what's even meant by the term information. Uh, maybe we have some rough ideas what sort of role and uh, and features it's supposed to have and satisfy, but uh, that that still leaves a lot of room for more precise notions and. Um, I don't know. Do you think this is right, or how would you approach this kind of general topic clarifying question of, of what information is even supposed to be? I think I could start by saying that, of course, the concept of information is being used by philosophers forever. Uh, as soon as you start wondering about knowledge, uh, behind knowledge there is information. Uh, if you start wondering or talking about logic, well, logic is also based on uh, processes to infer more information or extra information or unpack information from premises. There is no ethics without knowing through information what your options are, etc. So wherever you go in the philosophical debate, there is uh, uh, the use of information as a tool to do philosophy. The obvious not realization that was in front of everybody some years ago. Uh, it didn't take a genius. You just have to have your eyes open, to speak. Uh, some 30, almost 40 years ago now, uh, no, we, we're going for 40, uh, uh, about 30 years ago though, um, was that information was um, becoming a topic of its own in terms of philosophical understanding. It wasn't anymore a tool that philosophers would be using quietly, silently, implicitly, without awareness. Now imagine all the metaphysical uh, analysis that we've been developing, relying on this or that information. Um, but it was also it was a matter of uh, understanding the tool itself, the concept itself. So when I started developing, and I, and I, I so. I sought to establish this area of uh, philosophical analysis in terms of philosophy of information, the, the idea was quite simple. I mean, we have philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, uh, we have philosophy of art, philosophy of biology. So we have philosophies of single concepts and or philosophies of whole area of human understanding. Surely no, we needed a philosophy of information both as a single concept and as an area of a discipline, an area of investigation. So pretty much in the same way as we have a philosophy of knowledge, uh, a, a philosophy of logic, a philosophy of physics, well, 
I think the today in the 21st century, the area that was missing in the philosophical sort of uh, spectrum, in the philosophy, philosophy family, so to speak, uh, was this one. It's like we could not just go on and think that nothing has changed. So the digital revolution, the information revolution, whichever way you want to call it, was putting pressure uh, on philosophers like me. Now, at a different stage, you know, I was uh, I had just uh, come to Oxford you know, as a for my uh, postdoc uh, to realize that we had to brought philosophy to bear on, bring philosophy to bear on this particular concept, and develop uh, a much better understanding of information at large, with a view that maybe other disciplines sometimes share, sometimes they don't, to make a difference in the world. And that's the second half. Uh, I would like to insist on this, uh, if we have a moment, because uh, philosophy understood without any impact, philosophy that makes no difference in the world, including, shall we say, to my own life, or to society, to politics, to how we behave, how we shape uh, the the world in which we want to live, I think is missing a huge opportunity. It might be the one, most wonderful philosophy in the world, but we need to remember that Socrates died because he was trying to make a difference in Athens. That Plato went several times to Syracuse because he wanted to make a difference. He also established, together not with Aristotle in different times, different ways, two institutes. I mean, these were people who were making a difference in the world. Descartes you know, died because he wanted to teach philosophy <laughs> uh, uh, in the wrong place. Uh, it was too cold, yeah, joking about that. But clearly, he was so worried about what he was publishing that he was you know, also concerned about not making sure, making sure that it wouldn't be burned like uh, Giordano Bruno for his own ideas, and on and on and on. So I think that philosophy has always been in touch with the real world to make a difference, the best philosophy, sometimes for the wrong reasons, sometimes on the wrong side of history. Think about Heidegger. Um, but it, it does that by having a profound understanding of our conceptual design of the world. So that's what philosophy of information is. And what you said, and I close here, what, but information is a, is a very slippery, unclear concept. Well, isn't that exactly what calls for philosophical analysis and understanding? Well, we don't exactly know what we're talking about, and yes, we use it every day. So a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, missed opportunities also depend on a lack of a clear philosophy that provides the background for that design that needs to happen. So I think that uh, philosophy is uh, particularly useful uh, in the good sense of useful, not the pragmatic uh, uh, commercial sense today, conceptually, to contribute to the uh, understanding and shaping of uh, society and the world in which we live. That is exciting, uh, and I hope other people will join. Yeah, very good. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I mean, it's, it's somewhat similar to what goes on in these other areas of philosophy, like, you know, our understanding of knowledge. Well, okay, maybe that's not super precise, but you have philosophy to, to try to make some progress there or um, on our understanding of what that is or maybe proposals for, for how to think of, of what that of what that is. Um, I guess maybe one of my concerns is that um, the way that our concepts are, uh, even, and the way that we use this language can be kind of varied and imprecise. And um, the worry is that when some people are forwarding uh, a theory of information, they're not, it's not like they're offering an analysis of what people were talking about, but they're just, I don't know, it's sort of like conceptual engineering. They're just developing some theory, even if that's not exactly what people were talking about. I, I don't know if that's super clear, but um, you see where I'm coming from, is it? Yeah. Well, there are there are different ways in, in, or schools of doing this um, conceptual uh, analysis of, no, to provide a more understanding of what we're talking about. One is, uh, you know, takes into account the actual uh, uses, the actual developments, uh, and is normative, but insofar as it tries to put order in all this and show confusions sometimes, uh, misunderstandings, but it still has uh, a high respect, so to speak, for how we do things. So imagine uh, a, a philosophy of art or an aesthetics that were to disregard completely <laughs> what people like and dislike 
it would be weird, no? Uh, and yet, I mean, the, the, there is also a completely different approach, which tends to be highly normative uh, and disregard almost entirely what people do or do not do now, for example, when they are thinking. So anyone who has taken one single course in, you know, I, I used to, you know, for the first half of my academic life, I was a, uh, a, a let's call it a logician. I mean, I, I was a logician in a philosophy department, so I, I taught mathematical logic for the first half of my life. And, and you know, if you take an, in, even a single course, you don't have to do you know, anything more advanced, just you know, the most elementary um, uh, baby logic course 101, you know that that's not the way we think. I mean, no one uh, goes through a, a truth table or, or a quantifier uh, to solve anything in life. Um, it's more like mathematics. Uh, it's a formalization that provides the results we want. Philosophy, any philosophy, philosophy of information included, is always in a bit te of tension between looking at the world and trying to make sense of the world as it is, uh, usages included, for example, and at the same time, coming with uh, a blueprint, which is not a model of the world, but is a way of designing the world in a certain way, highly normative, saying this is the way it should be. This is a way that, no, we will implement such and such. Now, this tension, let me put it more simply, between model and blueprint, model of what there is and blueprint of what there should be, this tension is inevitable in philosophy. It's with the discipline because it's the main discipline where representing the world, no, to use a Greek word, the uh, uh, mimetic approach, and constructing the world, the poietic approach, join forces. So if, if you read anything no, that is decent philosophy, it will always contain the model and the blueprint, what it, what's out there and how to put it in the right way and not structure it, but still not imagine like astrophysics, no? It's not going to tell you the way it should be. It tells you the way it is, so to speak. But then it's also uh, a bit like uh, jurisprudence, economics, philosophy uh, of uh, law. It always tells you how it should be, how it could be, whether we could get there, so to speak. And so that's the tension between model and, and, and blueprint that uh, makes philosophy so attractive. Um, it can be confusing if people don't know and they think, oh, it should be one way or the other way. But it's actually both, and that's a good thing. Yeah, I, I definitely definitely agree with that. I mean, like the thought that philosophy and inquiry generally should just only be some descriptive project seems seems wrong. I mean, we you know <laughs> we can improve our descriptions, we can improve our ways of thinking about things. So you can think of it up prescriptively too. Yeah, yeah. And philosophy is both, as you said, using you know terminology. It's descriptive and prescriptive. Uh, it analyzes the world, but also tells the world the way it should be. And so the analysis and design, not to put a different kind of couple here, but the same idea, prescriptive, descriptive, uh, more analysis, more uh, normative uh, design, uh, the, the blueprint or the model. We need both. Right, good. And, and this the way you're describing this, um, I know you have, a, as I mentioned in the intro, a, a book that came out a couple of years ago called well, concerning the logic of information and, and philosophy is sort of conceptual design. Um, is this what you're um, hinting at here? I mean, what's the... Um, how would you describe the, the thesis and, and project of that book as of philosophy as conceptual design? Is that sort of related to what you're talking about? Or? So uh, this, uh, the, I think the subtitle is the more important part of the, uh, of the cover, uh, conceptual design. I wanted to make it clear that there was no reference, uh, despite the terminology, to Carnap, um, uh, conceptual engineering, that sort of uh, analytic school. Um, of course, it is an important precedent, is very interesting, is informative, enlightening, fruitful, but it's not what I mean here. Uh, what I mean here is actually pretty much in line with what we said uh, a moment ago, that philosophy as always, no, in its, at its best, uh, provided analysis and then of problems, and then solutions. The solution moment um, when a philosopher provides uh, some, its own, their own views about um, ethics, politics, knowledge, aesthetics, language, semantics, um, 
logic itself and possible worlds, you no know, cognitive science, um, uh, philosophy of biology, you name it. No, the whole spectrum. When they provide answers to the questions they have been able to identify and analyze, what well, the answering moment? How does it work? Uh, we're not, we're not, we don't run experiments, and we do not rely on deductions of some kind. No, we're not mathematicians. We don't prove anything. We don't test anything. Is this something like no man world, as you went, or fuzzy, unclear? No, that's that's the way. That's exactly not the. If you, oversimplifying, the empirical and the mathematical, the uh, testing and the proving are the constraints within which we move. But the space in between is the space of elaboration, um, discussion, uh, and confrontation among different views that by having a dialogue in a very sort of uh, Greek sense of uh, a noetic no, mental uh, process reaches some kind of stable conclusions that are still and remain forever open to debate. There is design. It's designing something that solves the, the problem, respects the constraints, takes advantage of the uh, affordances in view of a particular solution. So if you can design a chair, which is something you can sit on, but you can design a chair in no, a, an enormous amount of ways. Imagine a chair for a theater, a chair for my kitchen, a chair for a fancy sort of restaurant. It's still a chair, but it's a completely different kind of material, design, structure, cost, uh, etc. Well, likewise, philosophy develops, in a design sense, solutions that have different uh, content, different price in terms of assumptions required, uh, different convincing power, uh, and sometimes also different uh, historical value. No, they were valuable at that time, they lost value. The ones that we still read, no, imagine Plato's Republic or no, the Nicomachean Ethics or no, the, I mentioned Descartes, so the Meditations, etc. Wittgenstein's uh, uh, Tractatus, we still read them because they have this kind of lasting value in terms of, uh, oh, I can still use this chair, so to speak, because it's, it's a super design chair that was good in the 60s, but it's still great today. Others disappear more quickly. But it's design moment that really is here the keyword. And let me just add you uh, add, 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 add a final comment here. When we think in terms of innovation, we think in uh, almost always in terms of a combination between discovery and invention. One, the other, or both. Um, that's what innovates in industry, in society, institutionally. Um, conceptually, uh, we don't normally uh, uh, rely on this kind of terminology, but we can also discover uh, or invent uh, new ideas. You discover a new idea, if you're not ready somewhere, say, oh, look, imagine all the Renaissance when they discover the Greeks, so to speak. I'm always simplifying, but, or imagine someone at some point inventing the word uh, um, democracy, etc. But sometimes we design this, we have the elements, and we elaborate solutions. Now, solutions in philosophy are not invented, they are not discovered. Solutions for problems are designed. You, know, you put together all the conceptual apparatus that is required. You try to find the best solution for that particular uh, question that you have identified, and you confront in a sort of dialogical, uh, dialectical way other views, trying to find you know, the best way of solving the problems, answering the objections, reproducing, so to speak, the convincing power of that solution, which remains open to, to debate, because otherwise you wouldn't be doing philosophy. You will be doing some kind of science of a different kind. That's very interesting. I mean, how would you think more about the distinction between these solutions or these models as invented uh, rather than as designed rather than invented? Um, isn't it design a sort of an invention, or does it imply more um, or something else than that? Design um, is one of the concepts that philosophy should be analyzing more. Um, I'll tell you that if you put together every bit of decent philosophy done on design, it's a small shelf. No this much. Uh, there might be like 20, 30 items. You can become a, an expert on philosophy of design within a, a month of hard reading. Uh, there isn't that much. Uh, 
it's different from invention uh, insofar as it handles items that are already there is how you put them together. So imagine, for example, that we want to design um, a solution for uh, tackling the uh, um, problem of fake news online. Okay. Um, of course, you rely on some inventions, maybe some technological inventions, uh, some uh, even perhaps some discoveries in terms of um, uh, the laws of nature or maybe sociological laws of human behavior that need to be discovered. But how you put all that together, that is the design of the solution. And um, this can happen in not with an uh, industrial context uh, where you put you know, all those items together. Um, if you if you think about uh, a an electric car, an electric car is designed, but it's not invented. Uh, it takes advantage of inventions and discoveries. Uh, but how you put together those four wheels, the electric model, the battery, you know, the etc. That is the difference. Normally, when I when I teach, I give uh, students these three examples. Now you uh, you do innovation by Discovery America, no, discovering something not never seen before, uh, or a new no, physical law, etc. Uh, by uh, inventing the wheel and any other invention ever since, or by designing the iPhone, which contains nothing that at the time we didn't know. The first iPhone contained exactly a camera, no, a keyboard, uh, a screen, etc., uh, etc. Et there was nothing in particular that was never seen before, but how that came together in a single uh, solution, that was not pure genius. Um, to me, sometimes that is not the best philosophy. Uh, take you know, the example of Descartes and the meditations. Um, I'm not quite sure that there's anything invented or discovered by Descartes in the meditations, but how he puts together, for example, the argument of the malicious demon, well, that is a, a fantastic conceptual design of a mental experiment to test the ultimate no, foundation of your certainties. You start looking at that as no, to Descartes as a as a designer of conceptual objects or conceptual apparatus. And then you start thinking, wow, that's there's genius in this. I mean this is as good as Steve Jobs iPhone. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. I mean I guess I have to um maybe I'll check out this book, but uh yeah. I like the I like the basic idea that the distinction there. So so turning now to um more on the on information itself. Um so like one one notion of information um that is fairly well and uh well um fairly common anyway is the notion of like Shannon information. It's a relatively basic kind of correlational notion of information, you know, something carries information about some other thing if, you know, the state of that one thing correlates with uh the state of that other thing, um, roughly speaking, and, and and this turns out to be a fairly powerful um, notion of information, but not uh, it's not going to suffice maybe in certain areas, or maybe you want some other understanding of information, uh, maybe in semantics or or, or elsewhere. Um, yeah, so so how, how do you think about that? Do, do we need uh, um, other notions of information, or um, um, yeah? We do. We do we already have them. Um, there is, um, first of all, in that little book that you mentioned, actually, if anyone wants to check it, uh, I provide uh, what is actually a very short uh, introduction to information where I explain uh, the other concepts of information that we have. The one that you mentioned is, uh, if you like, the, the queen of all concepts, you know, uh, inf Shannon information, um, is for people who have never encountered it, uh, although they have been using it all their life, um, the easiest way to uh, sort of introduce it is to think in terms of uh, uh, answers to questions. So you toss a coin, you want to know whether the coin is uh, heads and tails, and uh, uh, I can send you that information with just one bit of you know, data. Um, if it have two coins, of course, no, the bit of data uh, increase is not known. Uh, if this three becomes eight, and et cetera. And that's why we have um, bytes go by two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. And uh, when you buy, or at least in the old, old, old days, you had all these fancy names of uh, funny numbers in terms of funny figures, in terms of quantity of data that could be recorded on a hard disk. 
because you know it proceeded in terms of quote unquote how many questions could you no know, could be answered by their hard disk you no know, how many questions could be recorded in terms of zero zero and ones in their hard disk now this is uh, I'm trying to provide a purely quantitative sense of the information because that that's exactly what it is is a quantitative analysis of the um, in these days we would call them digits that for example can be transferred through a channel or can be recorded on a on a, a USB stick uh, on a hard disk or can be stored in a cloud computing dot services etc it doesn't tell you anything that's the first the first kind is the counterpart sometimes we, we call it this syn the syntactic part of information that has a semantic counterpart the semantic counterpart is not touched by Shannon at all and that's already the first sense uh, in which we can already distance ourselves from Shannon um, the same sort of uh, one bit of information could be an answer to the 50 50 chance that uh, the coin is tails or heads or the 50 50 chance that she answer yes to my question will you marry me now clearly there is a bit of a difference in terms of content like that yes I hope is a bit more meaningful <laughs> life-changing <laughs> etc remind I said 50 50 you know so imagine that she in my case, I would ask my, my wife, you know, uh, I, I had in mind that it was a 50-50 chance. So channel information, only one bit of information. Toss coin, suppose it's fair, one bit of information. I still get a one bit of information. So there's no difference. Shannon wise, there is no difference. If, I, if you could send uh, uh, the, 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 a one bit that unlocks my whole encyclopedia or does not, I still get just one bit of information. Um, but obviously, you know, in terms of relevance, significance meaning of it uh, life-changing consequences contextual understanding zero that's not Shannon information so there's already the big divide not syntactic semantic uh, kind of uh, uh, information but we also have another orthogonal distinction uh, which you know I might introduce very quickly because it's kind of useful to have it in your not con in one's conceptual uh, um, bag. Um, we normally talk about information as something about the world. It tells you something about, no, did I have or did I not have coffee this morning for breakfast? Okay, that's about the world. The, the so-called train timetable kind of uh, information it tells you when the train arrives or when the train leaves. We also speak about that as semantic information, which is a bit misleading, but no. Uh, a it, the best thing to do is to think in terms of information about the world then we also think in terms of uh, information that we find in the world you can still quantify that Shannon Wyson uh, but for example the um, fingerprints the concentric uh, no, uh, rings of uh, that tells you the age of a tree um, the traces of uh, an animal in the forest well that's all something patterns in the world we describe them as information but it's got nothing to do with you know, the information about the world. It tells you that there's something out there, a pattern that you can acquire and extract information from it. Perhaps, as you said before, through correlation. You have those rings, you correlate those rings to ears, and you can tell the age of the year of the tree by looking at the number of rings when you cut the tree across. So there's a correlation of interest. At that point, the, the, the figure you get is about the age of the tree. So information about the world, information as the world, AS, no, as a pattern in the world. Then there's a third kind, which is information for the world. And that's everything that looks like remotely, like a recipe, an instruction, an algorithm, um, a music score. It doesn't tell you anything about the world and it's not in the world, like in say natural sense, but it's something that tells you how to perform a particular piece of music. Um, a recipe for a cake, uh, an algorithm. Uh, now, of course, all that uh, can also be quantified, Shannon-wise. So, as I said, it's orthogonal with respect to the distinction Shannon yes, Shannon no. Um, but it has a completely different sense. Uh, for example, it cannot be true or false. You look at a recipe for a cake and you can't simply ask, oh, is this true or false? No. Uh, you can say, oh, is this, for example, uh, the original uh, uh, recipe for their cake or not 
uh, is it a genuine, no, say, Italian recipe for that particular pasta or, or not? But you can't. It doesn't mean any sense because it's not it's not a truth bearer, to put it technically. It's got no athletic value, again, for the philosophers uh, among us. So fine, so something can be true or false, uh, the semantic kind. Something can be or cannot be in the world and have more or less degree of complexity, information in the world. And something can be more or less um, uh, genuine, original, authentic, uh, when it comes, say, to a, a script, for example, or successful. Uh, you get a string of symbols, is an algorithm, does it work, does it not work? Uh, but again, it's neither true nor false. Now, once you have this tripartite distinction um, about the world, uh, in the world, or about reality, in reality, or as reality, then you know a lot of things get way clearer. So when someone says, oh, but you can always quantify information, so information is Shannon, not really. Uh, of course, that cuts across. I can use Shannon theory or information theory to be more precise to quantify information in all these three areas. But it still doesn't tell me anything about, say, the value of that recipe because it reminds me of my grandmother uh, or the value of uh, those patterns there because they show me there are human beings on the beach. You know, a famous story, if you find a triangle on the beach, you know, you know there are humans there. No animal would ever throw a triangle and calculate the area of the triangle on the beach, you know, say, Pythagoras theorem. So there's a whole other world that has got nothing to do with Shannon. Now, in the past, some philosophers have been a little bit too much in love, a few, not many, with Shannon. And they've been, been trying to squeeze a philosophy of information, so to speak, from Shannon theory. I think it's a big mistake. You squeeze or you get the good grounding for a philosophy of information on meaning. No, in other words, data, just the symbols, no which are meaningful and well-formed. They have to have a syntax. They can't simply be random. If they're truly random, there is no information there, apart from the information about the system, which tells you that it is random, but that's another story. Uh, so randomized, completely randomized. Uh, so data, they, they lack that sense of being a vehicle for a message. But if you have the data and they are well-formed uh, and they uh, have meaning, then you start getting information. Of course, if you want to know whether there is the, the actual kind of information about the world, you also have to have a truth value. Uh, that's a long debate. Uh, no, we have had. Now, the, if the debate is clarified. I don't think anyone has changed uh, their minds, but people like me have been at the forefront uh, of the debate in terms of defending the view that actual information about the world has to be true. Otherwise, it's not information. You call it differently. You call it disinformation, misinformation. And I, the last thing I want to say, if you come to me and I'm a doctor and you ask me, do I do not have, say, this particular disease, and I just toss the coin and say, yes, according to the coin, that is a lot of Shannon information for you, is meaningful, is well-formed, but you go home, you come back to me and say, are you insane? You just toss the coin? Would you would you like me to answer? Or are you just ask for information? You didn't ask for true information. You're gonna kill me. <laughs> they said, "Yeah, you're a doctor. You're supposed to give me information, the the, the real, the, the real thing, not just the meaningful, well-formed data. I want to have the truthful ones too. So, did you think about it? Oh, okay. No, if you're not philosophically minded, then let me revise. Let me tell you what it was just like. So, I don't think that at some point it becomes a matter of vocabulary. So, but to me, when we talk about information as the queen of all kinds, has these properties: data, well-formed." meaningful, truthful. Then you have you know, a clear view about what the, world, the way the world is. And you know, for example, whether the train does leave at five o'clock or not. Uh, and uh, uh, as I said, there's, there's a huge debate, but um, the main point maybe for people listening to us is to remember that make sure that you know which kind of information you're talking about before getting into any debate, because people might be talking at cross purpose. They might be talking about different kinds. Right. Yeah. And the way you kind of preempted my, my um, next question I was going to ask, because you, you, this notion of, inf of semantic information that you discuss, you know, something qualifies as semantic information um, if it's well formed, uh, meaningful, and, 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 and vertical data. Um, and yeah, I could still see someone pushing back a little bit on, on this um, vertic verticality uh, requirement. I got what you were saying there, but like, 
like the thought that like, well, okay, what if someone just says something false or, um, they just guess and, um, still they've said something meaningful. I was in some ways carry semantic information. Does it not? I, I don't know. I'm, how would you, how would you think about, um, Look, I mean, uh, the fact that we use uh, the word information and and uh, we attribute that you know, those features to, uh, for example, any message that we receive, um, it's perfectly fine. I mean, you know, we're, we're kind of sloppy in, in real life, and there's no problem. Um, it's when we do philosophy and when we do science that we want to be more precise. Let me give you an example. I mean, you go to a um, to any supermarket, and uh, I mean, where do you find the tuna? With a fish, but tuna is not a fish; it's a mammal. So it's in the wrong, it's in the wrong place. You want to be there precise? Well, you can. You have to put tuna elsewhere. Uh, or bananas. Bananas are, are, are not fruit. Uh, so, um, but where do you find it? Next to the apples. That's okay. I mean, it, the function determines you no know, the location of you no know, bananas and tuna in the supermarket. I have no complaint. But if you are a biologist. I mean, it would be a bit embarrassing if you were to confuse tuna with fish or bananas with, with fruit. No, it's a different level. So everyday life, no, you tell me something. Uh, so who gave you the information? Oh, uh, Mary. Oh, but Mary, you know, told you a lie. Oh, shit. Okay. Well, she well, still gave me the, the information, but it's, it's, it's worthless. Or philosophically, you say, oh, okay, so let me just be precise. She didn't give me any information. She gave me a piece of disinformation or misinformation if she wanted to mislead me. So a lot of the times, you know, we, um, for example, it has happened to me. Uh, old guy, I'm still on Facebook. I know that nobody uh, is there anymore. Uh, shows my age. Um, but sometimes you share uh, something that turns out to be a complete fake news. Was I you know, intentionally misleading someone or was I just naive? I was naive. So I just disinformed you by sharing that information. Did I want to disinform you? No. Did I, I knew that that was, well, that's, that's, no, we have another word. It's called misinformation. We can use that. I mean, we can be, no, as philosophers, we need to be careful about words. You know, we are like, no, no, guys in the, in the, in the, in the chemistry lab, and you can't simply mix, you know, uh, things randomly. But at the same time, in everyday life, nothing happens. You know, if you call information, something that, uh, the prime minister said, normally, uh, our prime minister will lie, uh, so we know that's uh, what you mean. Uh, um, so I wouldn't um, attach too much. So uh, kind of normative or um, clarifying power to everyday uses of language. Uh, I remind my students normally that we still uh, talk about the uh, sun setting uh, as sun rising. The sun is not going anywhere, <laughs> uh, at least in terms of position with the earth. But of course, there's vocabulary that comes from a world when uh, you know, the Earth was at the center of the universe. So you know, we're still used to you know, the sun sets, the sun rises, etc., as if the sun were moving around uh, uh, the Earth. Good old days. I wouldn't do you know, astronomy um, uh, on the ground of that, that language and our commonsensical understanding. We also know what we're talking about. So tuna, bananas, sun rising, yes, fine. But that's not philosophy. That's not science. Yeah, um, I do. There was a bunch of other things I would like to cover. Unfortunately, um, I mean it's a big topic, so so we can only cover so much. But um, you have written a, a bit about the um, the self and the notion of information as as relevant to understanding the self, especially in an increasingly like digital um, age. H how would you kind of briefly think about um, information and and the self and and um, um, what sort of advantages there is to this sort of approach? I think it's important to understand that, at least in, in my own case, um, I know that there are people out there who um, engage in uh, metaphysical um, thinking. Uh, I'm too much of a Kantian, so I I find that uh, largely incomprehensible. Um, but I understand that there's a, there's a choice, uh, philosophically speaking, and um, is an unfortunate not barrier in terms of conceptual divide. For those like me who do not believe in, uh, in metaphysics, the the real thing, you no, know, the the Heideggerian kind, uh, or the one that people do uh, in a, at the same level of 
obscurity, as far as I'm concerned, conceptually speaking, as Heidegger, they do it through modern logic, but the difference is zero, meaning that you are not a Kantian. You don't constrain yourself within your epistemological access to reality, but you think that there is some, some kind of privileged access to reality provided maybe by a phenomenological analysis, by a modern logic analysis, or anything else. But for those people, uh, we really are moving apart. But for a Kantian like me, who has um, an epistemological metaphysics, in other words, whose uh, description of the world is always you know, uh, preceded by an epistemological analysis of how that construction of the world is, is possible on this side, then the answer to your question is uh, that we conceptualize the world in a variety of ways. Sometimes, often, those ways are determined historically, uh, contextually. There's been a time when we conceptualize human nature as a mechanism. We conceptualize ourselves as soul or fallen angels. We conceptualize ourselves as bodies you know, with a, a, a homunculus inside or a, a mind with a mind inside, etc. Now, take the, the, the since we mentioned Plato uh, and and Descartes. You now, imagine you know, a, a Platonic description of ourselves as a, as a chariot with two horses. Uh, it's a three part tight you no know, description of uh, the individual, or think in terms of uh, uh, you know, Descartes uh, the uh, analysis of uh, the uh, you know, dichotomy between the mind and the body, etc. Well, today, what's the best way of conceptualizing ourselves, not metaphysically, but through an epistemological approach to how we model ourselves in the world. I think that that is as informational organisms. Now, this should clarify a couple of things. One, I'm not saying that that's what we are intrinsically, because I find that question um, meaningless as far as I'm concerned. I'm Kantian, so don't ask me what the noumenon is, because I have no idea. But I do find that a commitment, ontologically speaking, to a modeling of ourselves as information organism makes perfect sense today. So the signal, as it were, the data that we get from the world can be modeled when it comes to ourselves in such a way that understanding ourselves as information organisms is the right thing to do today. But I think today, in this time, uh, because of the digital revolution, it makes a lot of sense. It's also enriching, and that's the other second point, because we add an ad another facet to this enormously, no, articulated and complex entity that is the self, the no, personal identity, is also useful. Because today we think more in terms of nodes and networks rather than mechanisms. And so instead of thinking a mechanism is something you start from bits and you construct that every bit is autonomous before the mechanism, a network is a place where the nodes emerge from the relations. They don't precede the relations. So it's not that you have nodes and then you link them. You have the links and the procedures and the processes and the relations out of which the nodes emerge. You have the roads and then the roundabout. You don't get the roundabout and the nodes. The mechanism is yeah, the opposite. You've got the pieces and you come, no, you put them together, some extra behavior emerges from the whole. Since we think more in terms of uh, um, networks rather than mechanisms, then seeing ourselves as nodes in a social network makes a lot of sense. It helps us also to understand, as I said, it's useful if we want to intervene on things like privacy. So privacy then at that point becomes something that is defending this emergent uh, entity called not the node in the network that is me and some of the information that constitutes me as me are unique and very private. I might want to dis no, not share them with someone but not with someone else. So to summarize, an economic view of privacy coming from the bottom up now is, an, uh, is a view of privacy as something that I own. I own my data as I own my car. And therefore, no, you can't use it because it's mine. Remember, lock, no, uh, privacy and uh, private as and uh, as ownership. Um, you can stop people from using it. I think it's very outdated. Uh, it's a very 20th century view. But privacy, not as a chapter in the philosophy of economics, but privacy as a chapter in the philosophy of mind, identifies something like me with some information that are so intrinsically me making me who I am that needs to be defended in order to make sure that I don't get cloned or 
uh, my autonomy gets erased by being not nudged and influenced too much, or I'm uh, sort of uh, abused uh, by the misuse of my information. For example, say uh, through uh, some kind of blackmailing or uh, uh, scandal or being made uh, uh, the, a joke of myself, etc. Um, uh, all this has a completely different light on personal identity, but it's an informational theory of privacy and an information theory of personal identity, which I said is not incompatible with other things, but it adds a new chapter to the long book of philosophy. And if I may conclude here now and say goodbye with this, I think that that is maybe the, the message that I would like to leave, is um, we need to write the chapter for the 21st century. My invitation to any philosopher uh, out there, uh, especially if you're just starting now, don't rely too much on the past. Think with your own mind. We need new philosophical way of understanding the world that is in line with the challenges we have today. The past is a great history. It's what you build on. But don't think for a moment that we can just expand and extend chapters written in the past and business as usual. Every generation challenged as we are by these deep transformations, and the digital is a historic transformation, needs to be able to provide the conceptual design, the kind of right questions, great answers that make sense today. We want to make sense of the world. We want to make it a better place. We need the best philosophy that we can possibly develop. Just reheating up, re rehearsing, you know, re-evaluating something from the past is not good enough. We can't simply you know, stretch that uh, uh, cover all the way to 21st century and say, Nothing changed, just more Wittgenstein, just more Heidegger, job done. We need something new for today. And it's perfectly possible. We just have to open your eyes and stop so imitating the past. That's, that's very well put. I, I, very, I very much like that. Um, there's a lot. Yes. <laughs> of course, there's a lot more stuff we could cover. And, and, and um, but I'll, I'll let you go. Thank, thanks so much for being here and, and taking my questions. And watch. Uh, uh, good luck and thank you for the invitation uh, there's a, an enormous amount of concept work that we need to do as good philosophers and I'm, I know, wish you all the best because this is one way of doing it thank you